Thank you. Uh, you know, I've done a number of speeches and presentations to companies uh, around town, and half the time I'm not lying when I'm not quite sure what the technology or what that product might be. Well, I know who Microsoft is, and to think uh, right here, some technology that changed the world, done in the great Northwest, my hometown, so special and such an honor for me to be here today and to present to you and share with you some of my business journey, NFL journey, and hopefully how it relates to you and your small business. You know, I was blessed to play 12 years in the National Football League. I played for three Super Bowl winning coaches, Jimmy Johnson of the Miami Dolphins, Dick Vermeil, the Kansas City Chiefs, Bill Belichick, the New England Patriots, and also the late great Don James won a national championship with him at the University of Washington. And I've heard so many great speeches and presentations and halftime talks. And always the best ones for me are the ones when they're just from the heart. And really today, that's what I want to do. I want to share with you some of my stories, my experiences, and hopefully you can take them, relate it to your situation, your position, and wherever you might be with your business. Teamwork and leadership are going to be the two big things I focus on today. I'm going to focus on the great teams I played on, how we ultimately came together as a team and had success. And then I'm also going to focus on leadership and some of the great qualities that three great men taught me along the way in my journey. Let's start off with the two great teams I was fortunate to play for. And I know if you're a Seahawks fan, you might be a little disappointed. Yes, the 2001, 2003 New England Patriots and also the San Francisco 49ers. I promise you we won't include the Pittsburgh Steelers too, who ruined the 2006 Super Bowl for you. But my journey was with these two organizations and I'll start with the Patriots. Teamwork, right? We've all heard the great term teamwork. But in order to have great teamwork, I think you first and foremost have to start with a group of individuals that are willing to put the team first. And this is hard to do, very difficult to do in this me first society that we live in today. It always amazed me, my time in New England, the focus on team. Coach Belichick taught us from day one that the strength of the wolf was in the pack, within the group, within the organization. And I swear that those scouts, that front office, that personnel department, when they're looking for players to bring to that team, they are looking for guys with the same selfless qualities that will buy into this team culture. And then the other great thing that Bill Belichick does, and I know he's been well documented. Obviously, you win four Super Bowls. You want to hear the story, the Patriot way. You heard the other night on the, on the NFL Network, do your job and that cool story. Well, that's great and all, but in order to do your job, your role has to be defined. And Bill Belichick was so great at defining the roles for his players. You know, I remember the 2001 offseason, I had just been released by the Miami Dolphins, and I signed with the New England Patriots. And um, after training camp, Coach Belichick pulled me into his office, and he said, you know, Heward, you know, obviously uh, Bledsoe's the starting quarterback, but uh, we're going to go with Brady as the number two, and you as the number three. I just feel like Brady has a little a better feel for the offense than you right now. So right then and there, I didn't know if I could ever trust or believe in him again or if he had a good feel for his players. But uh, in all kidding aside, even though I was the number three guy, Bill Belichick made me feel like I was the most important guy on that team. He defined my role as a backup. He made me feel as important as Tom Brady. He made me feel as important as Teddy Bruschi, the starting middle linebacker. And that's what makes him special. And one great example and great story you know, going back to my magical time there with the Patriots, was the 2003 season. And we were getting ready to play the, the uh, Indianapolis Colts in the AFC Championship. And uh, I remember coming to work that week on a Wednesday, getting ready to, to watch film and study up the, the Colts. And Coach uh, Belichick pulled me aside and says, hey, look, Damon, you know, we played these guys earlier in the season. I know you know a little bit about their defense. I really want you to hone in and focus this week on being Peyton Manning in practice. I want you to watch the, the Indianapolis Colts offensive tape and really study this guy to give our defense a great look as the scout team quarterback. Well, we went on that Sunday to beat the Colts in the AFC Championship. Peyton Manning threw four interceptions, and we're going back to the second Super Bowl in three years. And in the locker room after the game that afternoon, he pulled the team up, and he said, hey, the guy getting the game ball this afternoon didn't even cross the lines, play one snap in the football game. 
the game ball is going to Damon Heward. And I'll never forget that. You know, here's this backup quarterback, didn't even play in the game. Yet he knew my role, he, he defined my role, I did my job, and the team had success. And he gets everybody to buy into that. That at the end of the day, your individual legacy is ultimately going to be defined by the team's success. And it's the same thing in business. You know, if you can define the roles for your individuals, for your workers, you lay it out in front of them, they trust the coworkers, they, they, they give it up to the customer first. Hard to do, but when you do that, it's amazing how everything, your individual goals seem to take care of themselves too. Such a magical ride in New England. I think the other great experience that I had in New England was the first Super Bowl team, Super Bowl 36. You know, if you remember back then, um, you know, the Patriots were kind of underdogs. You know, right now is sometimes not a, not a great light, you know, shining on, on that organization with some of the accusations and whatnot. But back then, you know, 9-11, 2001, you know, we were all Patriots. It was a tough time in our country. And Super Bowl 36, we elected as a team to come out of the huddle, excuse me, out of the locker room, walking onto the field on Super Bowl Sunday. You know, if you can think of all these other Super Bowls in NFL's past, you think of the players, they're kind of five seconds of individual fame on the worldwide stage where they're pounding their chest, they're pointing to the sky, you know, so-and-so from this hometown, you know, this position, that position. The Patriots that afternoon wanted nothing to that. We were actually fined by the league for not doing that, but instead walking out of that tunnel as a group. And that moment, that defined that team that season. We were 12-point underdogs. We were the biggest underdog in Super Bowl history going into that game. I think our defense ranked 12th in the league. Our offense was in the low 20s. There was, we had no business being in that Super Bowl, let alone going out there and winning it. But we walked out there as a team, a blue-collar team, a team that everybody bought into their role, came to work each day, did their job, went out there and beat the Rams, the greatest show on turf. A special, special day, a special moment coming out of that tunnel as one heartbeat. I think to this day a lot of teams do that because of the precedent that we set that day that it was all about the team and all about the unit. So I took with me that team first attitude to Kansas City. And, um, you know, I, honest to goodness, probably would have retired and my NFL legacy would have been a, a Peyton Manning impersonator. But um, I was able to go on to Kansas City and get a chance to play later in my career. You know, but before I dive into Kansas City, I do want to focus on one other note up here. I want to talk about football being the ultimate team sport. You know, in football, there's three phases, right? You got the offense, the defense, the special teams. And if they don't work together, it's hard to win. And you think of an offensive unit in particular. You know, you got to have the boys up front blocking for you. You got to have the receivers getting open downfield for the quarterback to deliver the perfect throw. So many moving parts. The defense, the special teams all combined. So similar to business. And what I've learned in my short time with my business project is that all these phases have to work together. Whether it's the financial side of things, whether it's the marketing, the sales, the human resources, so many moving parts. And I think that's why there's so many great examples and stories of business and sports and the combination of them all working together. And I'm telling you, my time in New England, with that leadership, with those roles, and with our ability to come as a team, has come in so handy for me in my passing time wine business that I'll get into a little bit later. But after my time in New England, I took that team first mentality and all the things that I've learned with me to Kansas City. And as I mentioned earlier, I think my legacy would have been this Peyton Manning impersonator. But I got a chance to play late in my career and play a lot of football and, and play at a high level. And I can remember the, the 2006 season like it was yesterday. Um, Trent Green was our starting quarterback, a, a Pro Bowl player himself, our team captain, our leader. And week one of the season, he took one of the most grueling hits I've ever seen in the history of the National Football League. He was laying on the floor, on the field, unconscious. They carried him off the field. I wasn't sure if he was dead or alive. And of course, the coach looks at you and says, hey, next guy up, get in there. And I'll never forget that moment and that time and getting in that huddle and looking at my teammates in the eyes and thinking, wow, this is a rough one. None of us had really been in that situation where our leader, our team leader, was carried off the field like that. And it was tough. We went on to lose that afternoon. But I remember getting back in the building that next week as we prepared for our next game with a lot of question marks. 
You know, I hadn't started the game in six years. You know, a lot of these guys looked, in the, they looked me in the eye, I think the coaches too. Like, can we really win with this guy? Well, we kind of put our toe in the water that next week at Denver. Very conservative on offense. We ran the ball a lot. We lost nine to six. But some foundation was set right there that, okay, this guy's not going to lose the game for us. Let's open this thing up. Let's go. He's bought in. We went out there the next eight weeks, won six of the next eight games, and I helped lead our team to the playoffs. And I'm telling you, it was my time in New England where I learned about accountability, where I didn't want to let my teammates down. That really came to mind, came to the forefront when I had that opportunity to actually be the guy in Kansas City. The other great thing that happened in Kansas City was my time with Dick Vermeule. And this guy was all about relationships. And really, at the end of the day, I mean, it truly is all about relationships. It's an old saying, you know, they're not going to care until they know that you care. And as a coach, when he genuinely cared about us, not just as players, but as people, and you sensed that, and you felt that, you played at another level. The next great experience that I had in my NFL journey was another man who took relationships to a whole another level, and that was Mike Singletary in San Francisco. And, you know, I actually never made the team in 2009 there. It was my last cup of coffee. It was my 14th NFL training camp. But it really stands out in my memory over the course of my career, fast forward all these years. It was the summer of 2009, and we reported to training camp like you always do that first day. You know, you, you have a physical, you have a team meeting, and at that team meeting, Coach Singletary's like, all right, guys, tomorrow we're not practicing. And all of us are like, wow, sweet, cool, we're not practicing, that's great. He said, instead, I want you to write down these five questions. The first question was your background, your name. The second question, what was the most difficult time in your life? The third question, what was the happiest time in your life? The fourth one, who are your heroes? And the fifth one, who would you die for? These questions were deep. And I remember going back to the hotel. He says, get out of here. Go back to the hotel room. Think about how you want to answer these. And then show up tomorrow knowing that you're going to be up in front of the team answering these five questions. And I remember going back to the hotel that night thinking, man, this is deep. I've been to 14 NFL training camps. I've never been asked to do this. Can we please just put on our pads and play football? And I thought, why? Why are we doing this? Well, when I showed up in the building the next day, and 85 players, another 25 coaches, front office execs, got up there and shared their story over the course of 10 hours with a couple of breaks, a quick lunch, I got it. He was really trying to build a connection. And it's hard to get up and public speak in front of people, but every last guy did. And when every last guy told their story, I knew a little something different about my teammates. I had a new little respect level for the guy I was lining up next to. I bought in, I got it, it was awesome. And today, to this day, whether it's coaching my kids or my own business, I might not ask those same five questions, but I make each and every employee, each and every kid, tell me a little bit more than maybe you wanna tell me about yourself. What it does is it builds this incredible connection. It's a talking point, it's a breaking ice point. You get to know your customer, your teammate, your friend a little bit better. And like I said earlier, at the end of the day, isn't it really all about relationships? So take a genuine interest in your teammates. And after that day, I did. And I learned so much more about each and every teammate on my team than I had ever known before. You know, the other thing that happened to me that training camp, my last one in 2009, is I was fighting for NFL survival. I was 36 years old, you know, trying to survive in a young man's league, is I found myself in the most difficult bind I'd ever been in as a player. I was battling with a rookie, another fellow quarterback, who had a little bit of a learning disability. He was an incredible athlete, an incredible talent, a fifth round draft pick, and I was battling him for that third position on the San Francisco 49ers during that training camp. And I remember time and time again, him coming to me, asking me questions about this protection or that particular coverage or that play. And I remember being torn to no end about, man, do I really help this guy? 
mean, this guy, we're, we're fighting for the same job. And it was difficult. It was the toughest moment in my career. And, you know, I'd been around younger guys in Kansas City where, you know, I knew I was going to make the team. I'll help this young kid in here at training camp. But I'd never really been in the situation where I was fighting for my NFL life as a veteran with a really young guy. And I was torn. But I'm not going to lie to you. I took the high road. I worked with him. You know, I don't want to say that he made the team at my expense or whatnot, but it certainly it, it didn't hurt his chances when I was there to help him and answer his questions. And when I got my walking papers uh, from Coach Singletary and packed my truck and headed north to Seattle, you know, on that long ride home, you know, I thought, you know what? It was the right thing to do. It was the same thing when I came into this league 14 years ago with the same dreams and aspirations that an older veteran like Dan Marino and Craig Erickson showed me the ropes and helped me, taught me how to be a pro. And so I always think of that in this business community and in this business world, you know. Don't be afraid to help your fellow teammates. You know, sometimes I've got to train a guy to do my job. No, 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 no. When it's in the best interests of the company, like I said earlier, it's amazing how your individual goals and the long term it all works out. Now, granted, I never played pro football again, but I followed that kid, you know, and there was a relationship there that lasted forever, and I did the right thing. And at the end of the day, it is. You do the right thing, you take the high road, you trust and you build those genuine relationships. That's what it's all about. Whether it's football or your business, trust in those relationships. The other fortunate thing I, I get to do today is I'm the Director of External Relations at the University of Washington. I get to wear a bunch of hats. I'm involved in recruiting and player development. I'm the color analyst on the radio for, for Husky football broadcasts. And I've seen another great coach, a coach with a, the only two-time Paul Bear Bryant award-winning college football coach of the year award, Chris Peterson, come to the University of Washington and change the culture really overnight. He's only been there a year and a half now and I've been amazed at his way of bringing a team and a group of guys together. You know, a couple of fun things that we do to build the team. You think, well, how do you really do this? Well, one real interesting thing we do every summer during training camp is the Husky Olympics. And I am the commissioner of the Husky Olympics. And I think, you know, other companies, teams I've been around, it's like, hey, let's, you know, let's go to a movie. Let's, you know, let's go bowling. No. When I'm talking about the Husky Olympics, I'm talking about nine events over the course of three weeks during training camp where we are doing a skit, doing a free throw competition, a closest to the pin, dodgeball, all these fun events that we do as a team. I gotta backtrack a little bit though because to really explain it, we divide the 100 guys into 10 groups of 10. And no O-lineman can be on the same team with another O-lineman. The O-line coach can't have any players on his 10-player team that he coaches in the room every day. The team is completely split up into 10 groups of 10, and they get to compete and bond, and we have so much fun with this thing. And it really is amazing when you get this sort of competitive situation amongst the guys that's fun, you keep track of the score, it isn't just about the competition. It's all the other bonding that comes along with it. You know, and this is something I've really tried to do with my business too. And what are some of these fun things we can do with my winemaker, my barrel rep, all these different folks that I work with to really bring us closest together. So have some fun, have some competition, go out there, compete together, and watch how the thing grows. You know, the other really neat thing Coach Pete does is, and I don't ever remember this over my time in the National Football League of 14 years, was moving guys around in the locker room. And, you know, three months, you're in a locker, three months later, clean it out, we're moving you next, next door to the defensive backs or moving you next to the kicker. And I think, you know, why not in the business world? Same thing, you got your office, your desk, move it around so you have to interact with each other. So you get to know one, each, one another a little bit better. And it's amazing how that has worked too. And then he focuses much like Bill Belichick on this team then the unit, and then me. And then it's amazing how the success goes, if you can put it in that order. And like I said about the Patriots, when it comes to bringing in guys that are selfless and that'll buy into this team first mentality, Coach Pete does it the same way. And he, he labels it or terms it, coins it, 
OKG, our kind of guy. And I think that the world, the conception out there is that this is a choir boy and no. An OKG really at the end of the day is a good kid with some of these selfless qualities that loves ball. A good kid that loves ball. I mean, think about that. Aren't those the kind of employees you want? Just a good person that has a passion or an interest or a love for this particular product, this technology? It's all the same, whether it's business or sports, so similar, so many characteristics that tie together, and when it all comes together, it's magical. So summing up teamwork, you know, I've said that word selfless so many times today. I mean, that's it, really, at the end of the day. Having a group of people that buy into the idea that the strength of the wolf is in the pack, that as a team, your individual legacy is ultimately going to be defined by your team's success. And when you put the team first, you're going to be blown away how your individual goals all just seem to take care of themselves. And last, take a genuine interest in your fellow workers, in your customers, all of them. Build lasting relationships that make it fun to go to work, that make it fun when you have success, because you've all done it together. So now I'm going to kind of dive into the, the leadership side of this thing. And there's a great quote, uh, actually from a movie called Drumline. I'm not sure if you saw it. But uh, it says, before you can lead, you got to learn how to follow. And the three guys that I met in the first five years of my National Football League journey taught me so much about leadership that when it was my time to play in Kansas City, I was ready. And these are three great leaders, three great men, with three incredible characteristics that separated them from the pack. And I'm going to start with my business partner, Dan Marino. You know, Dan Marino was arguably the greatest pure passer of all time. I mean, even when this guy was 38 years old, he stepped on the field. He believed he was the very best. But it was Dan's confidence, his athletic arrogance, that was so contagious to everybody. You know, I was a young rookie. I had been cut the year before. I was just hanging on, just trying to make the team, scratching, clawing any way I could. And then I met Dan, who just, when he walked into the room, it lit up. Dan was the man. You know, even if he threw three interceptions in a game, he was going to throw that fourth touchdown pass in the fourth quarter and beat you. But it was his confidence, like I said, his swagger that makes him who he was, made him the leader he was. The way that he practiced, practiced so hard, competed so hard, Special, special leader, special quality. Taught me so much about being a pro. Taught me how to be a pro. And it's the reason I lasted 12 years in the NFL was because of Dan Marino, his confidence, and the way it just fell off onto you as a fellow teammate. The only other guy that I met with that same confidence, but even crazy determination, was Tom Brady. You know, like I said earlier, when I signed with the Pat Patriots in 2001, I was supposed to be Drew Bledsoe's backup. And then this skinny kid out of Michigan comes out of nowhere and, and beats me out in training camp. You know, and I always took pride in hard work and preparation, but I had never met anybody who worked as hard as Tom Brady. And there were three situations that came up that first year in 2001 when I was with him, when Drew got hurt and Tom had his chance to be the guy that I'll never forget. And I think it sums up Tom Brady's determination. It was after his second career start, we're down in Miami, we lost a game, I think by a touchdown, and Tom had a pretty average game, and I remember on the plane ride home back up to Foxborough, Tommy's like, ah, oh, man, you know, that was a tough loss today. But this is the same game of football I've played my whole life. Man, I can do this. I'm going to be a great one. I'm thinking, okay, that's cool, Tom. I got you. Fast forward 12 weeks later, we're getting ready to go up to Pittsburgh for the AFC Championship, and we're watching film in the film room on a Wednesday, and Tommy stops the clicker. He's like, Damon, there's no way these guys can cover Troy Brown in the slot. Are you kidding? David Patton's going to be wide open if they play this coverage. We're going to go up there and just get after these guys. And I'm thinking, man, the Steelers are 15-1. and one. They haven't lost at home in two years. Okay, Tom, right on. I love your determination. We go up there. We win. Fast forward two weeks later. It's Super Bowl Sunday. And we are the biggest underdogs in Super Bowl history. And Tom nudges me next to me in the locker and says, Damon, do you have any idea how good it's going to feel in three hours to be world champs? Do you know what that's going to feel like? At that point, I was believing, man. You know, at some point along the lines, Tom Brady made a decision and was so determined to be the best. 
And fast forward all these years, he still plays with that backyard enthusiasm, that passion. Four Super Bowls later, he's arguably the greatest quarterback of all time. And it's his determination and his leadership that gets it done week in and week out. And I talked a lot about Bill Belichick, the third leader that really shaped me. I talked about him defining our roles and getting us to buy into the team mentality. But the other thing that he does more so than anywhere I've ever been is his attention to detail and preparation. No stone is unturned in the Patriot way. We were so prepared week in and week out. And it's interesting, I haven't been back to Foxborough in a few years, but even early on with all the success we had there, there was not a lot of past reference to championships and Super Bowl success, but there was one saying up on the wall, and it was all battles are won before they are fought. And this comes from Sun Tzu, Art of War, 6th century BC. See, Bill Belichick's teams, they don't win on Sunday. They win on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday on the practice field in their battle of preparation. That's how they win on Sunday. That's it. They are prepared. They are ready to go. And every guy is expected to know that game plan. Another fun story from my time there was my first year with Bill. And I remember on a Wednesday, before we'd gotten the game plan, you know, for that week, you know, Monday in the NFL is kind of a day you come back in after the game, you watch the previous film, you sweat, you work out. Monday in the books, Tuesday's your day off. Well, Wednesday you come in, you get your game plan and start the preparation for the next week. Well, I remember one Wednesday morning at our team meeting before I got in the book, Coach Belichick made me stand up in front of the room. He's like, hey, Damon, you know, who's the nickel corner for the Cowboys this week on third down? And I didn't know. He said, what? What if Brady gets hurt and you got to play? You're telling me you don't know who you're lining up, who's lining up across from you? I'll never forget that. You see, Belichick expected the quarterbacks to be in there on Tuesday, on their day off, preparing for that opponent. That was his commitment to preparation. That's what he expected of us, the players, and his preparation. There's no secret to his success. It starts and ends with that preparation and his leadership. And that's what makes Bill Belichick arguably the greatest coach of our time. So all these experiences, all these great people, all these special players and coaches I've been so blessed to be around, how has it helped me in passing time? In a big way, every day, every single thing I do. You know, Dan Marino and I talked about when I was a rookie of one day making a Washington State wine when I moved back to Washington full time after my playing career. And we took all these NFL experiences and put it right into our business plan. Nothing has changed at all. We know, much like the NFL, the wine world is one of the single most competitive consumer products in the world. How are we going to do it? We're going to build an amazing team. We're going to build a, get a winemaker to buy in. We're going to have some sales folks. We're going to build these amazing relationships with all these distributors around the country to make this thing happen. Again, there's no difference whether it's football or business. They're so tied together. And I think about Dan and I, I think about Coach Belichick, you know, when we're in meetings as a group, I think about my customers and the relationships that I want to have with them and how they come first in every single thing that I do. You know, if a cork pops out on the way when it's shipped across the country because of the heat, they're getting a brand new one, they're getting a personal letter, they're getting taken care of. And I tell you, this wine passion, this wine bug, I absolutely love this thing. As I said, it's competitive, there's no doubt about it. But it's a product that you work so hard to make. You know, 2010, we really started this thing. We just released our first wine here in 2015. And I'm so excited to say that all the stars have aligned and it's come together. We made our a Cabernet, our 2012 Cabernet, our first vintage. We got 94 points in the wine advocate, 93 in the wine spectator, 93 in the wine enthusiast. And it's something we're all so very proud of. You know, the fruit comes from three different vineyards over in eastern Washington. You know, where my great-grandfather was a, one of the first Concord grape growers in the state. So I got this fun agricultural history with the Heward family. I've come full circle now. And again, it's amazing. All the relationships, all the connections, all of your life's experiences. And here you are using them uh, in a family business that goes way back to the early 1900s. And again, so fun for me, so fun for Dan to continue our relationship 
you know, all these years later after football to put our hearts into a product uh, and, and a passion that means so much to us. So really, again, I just want to thank you for your time today. Hopefully some of my stories and my journey uh, relates to your business and your situation. And you can make that connection. And remember, it's all about the team. It's all about those relationships and being great leaders. And then once again, having fun and doing the right thing along the way. And ultimately, you too will have some success. So thanks for having me. I grew up in eastern Washington. My great-grandfather grew Concord grapes in Grandview, Washington. My dad grew up playing in the Horse Heaven Hills where we're getting fruit from. I grew up in a very ethnic neighborhood, and a lot of people made their own wine. And my great-grandfather made homemade wine. So it was in the history of my family. We got some great fruit to work with, a great young winemaker. This is a passion of ours. It's passing time. It's what you're doing when you're with your family, you're with your friends, you're around the table. There's nothing better than an awesome glass of wine, drinking wine, passing time. But we also know when it's third down in the red zone and you're down six and there's 10 seconds left in the game, you got to score. It's passing time.